All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday night Lightner Observatory and Planetarium live stream. It's Tuesday night when we normally are open to the public, but uh, in this era of most of Yale University being closed to the public, we're doing this uh, live stream on YouTube to show you what's up in the sky and talk a little bit about astronomy. Take your questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be watching the YouTube live chat occasionally and uh, I'll try to answer uh, questions uh, as quickly as I can. Or if you have any comments, or if you've seen anything interesting in the sky recently, uh, let us know. So I have the uh, camera pointed at uh, one of the telescopes that I've set up tonight. I actually brought out three telescopes. Uh, and I've got an 8-inch telescope over here pointed at the moon. So I'll try and uh, come over here and... Um, adjust the focus on the camera so you can see what the telescope's pointed at. Let's see, so let's, uh, let me adjust the focus on this. And try and get the moon in focus. There we go, that's a little bit better. So now you can see uh, the inner telescope's pointed at the moon right over there. And then over here you can see an airplane flying right across the sky. Right, right about there. Whoops, there's there's an airplane, and it's just about to cross below the uh, planet Jupiter. So there's the planet Jupiter right there, and uh, I can show you uh, what else I have out here tonight. So I've also got the usual 12-inch telescope over there. Now uh, I'm teaching a an observing lab class remotely. I don't have any students coming to the observatory, but I'm uh, teaching a class where students log into the observatory computers and control that 12-inch telescope right there, um, as well as the 16-inch tele telescope that's in the dome in there, which is our usual uh, advanced lab and student research uh, telescope. Uh, I'll do a few Tuesday nights from inside there a little bit later on, especially as it gets colder. I'll probably <laughs> want to be inside uh, uh, to do that. Uh, so tonight I have some students that are going to log in and control the 12-inch uh, telescope to point at some interesting objects. I had hoped I would be organized enough that I could set it up and get it focused on something uh, before we started the live stream, but, but that didn't happen tonight. It's been a very busy day. Uh, maybe towards the end of the stream today I'll start setting that up, uh, getting it ready for observing. I also have my 5-inch Newtonian telescope over here. Uh, let's get, see if I can get that focus. Um, this is a telescope that I've talked about a couple of times. It's my own telescope, and um, it's a great starter telescope. It's very portable, uh, five-inch diameter reflecting telescope. And I'll try and I'd like to demo that uh, for you tonight and tell you where you can get one because I think it's a really good value. Uh, it's made by uh, well, it's made by Celestron, but it's sold by a company called Astronomers Without Borders, which is a uh, global astronomy education and outreach organization based in California. So good organization and half of the revenue from the uh, Astronomers Without Borders One World Telescope actually goes to worldwide astronomy education. So uh, do a good, good thing for that as well. Uh, I also recommend that 90 millimeter Mead telescope that I sometimes have out. I think either that one or this one are good starter telescopes. The Mead telescope is maybe a little more versatile because you can use it for terrestrial observing, like bird watching and nature viewing and so forth, whereas uh, this 5-inch Newtonian is really optimized for astronomy, for putting your eye to the eyepiece and looking at objects out there in the universe. Uh, so anyway, back to the sky over here. Um, I will uh, point the camera at the sky and talk a little bit about what's up in the, uh, what's up in the universe. I uh, usually will uh, point the uh, camera just, just up at the sky and uh, <laughs> talk about what should be there. Um, uh, but I was noticing on the stream from two weeks ago that uh, I really could see the constellations I was talking about. I can't see them really on the view screen here, but uh, uh, I don't see why I can't actually uh, <laughs> show those in the sky. So we'll do that here in a minute. I have a little video camera connected to this little 8 inch telescope. So let me show you a quick view of the moon, which is what I have the telescope pointed at right now. Uh, and then we'll point around and look at some other, uh, we'll uh, look at what, what are some other things in the sky. And then we'll move the telescope to look at some other uh, interesting objects. We can look at Jupiter and Saturn, which are right over there. 
And then Mars is actually coming up over in the east. Now, I, I think it'll be uh, this time of year, it's coming up over in the east at sunset. Now, I think um, it's going to be too low to see it uh, before we have to stop tonight around uh, around 9 o'clock. But uh, it's getting uh, higher in the sky at sunset. It's going to be opposite the sun on October 13th. And so Mars is going to be a nice target for uh, small telescopes very soon, and sort of a, from a, a, from around now until around, uh, you know, I would say a couple of months from now, maybe three months or so from now, it's going to start dimming as the Earth gets further and further away from it. So, hello everyone, how are you doing? Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Faison. I teach here at Yale in the Astronomy Department. Uh, I'm the director of the Leitner Observatory and Planetarium, where I am right now. Uh, as I said, usually we open to the public on Tuesday nights, uh, you know, in, normal, in the normal times, as we, as we say, uh, we would open up the planetarium for planetarium shows. I haven't done a planetarium show on the stream in a while, because just because most of the nights I've been uh, setting up the camera and plugging in the computer to YouTube, it's been clear, so I want to come out and show live views of what's up in the sky. Um, so um, uh, that's what I've been doing, but uh, I'll, I'll actually show a couple of planetarium shows and also uh, go back to talking to some other astronomers about recent discoveries in astronomy on a future live stream when it's cloudy. If you tried to tune in last week, I had to cancel last week just because I had some technical problems with my uh, camera, so I had no way to put video out, so I just decided I had to cancel. So I got that fixed, and I have a backup. So uh, hopefully won't run into that problem uh, again. Let's see what the 8-inch telescope is seeing right now. So I'm going to switch over to the output from that little red video camera that's on the back of the 8-inch telescope, which is giving me a nice view of the moon. OK, here we go. All right, there's the moon. Doesn't look nice. <laughs> uh, focus looks. Okay, uh, yeah, I think the focus is fine. Um, and I, this, comp this uh, telescope and telescope mount is not a computer-controlled telescope mount, so I won't be able to point at things on the screen and then move the telescope, but I do have a motorized controller right here, which allows me to adjust where the telescope's pointed just a little bit. So I can uh, kind of point the telescope a couple of different places. So we had a new moon last Friday, and I think we have a first quarter moon this Thursday. Today, of course, is the fall equinox. Uh, happy, happy fall equinox, everyone. So we get uh, equal hours of night and equal hours of day. The sun rises exactly due east and sets exactly due west, and it's the first day of fall. And it feels like it. It's nice and chilly, nice and crisp tonight, although there's still a few mosquitoes out uh, flying around me. Um, so uh, here's a nice view of the moon, and I think when the um, when the moon is like crescent or near first quarter like this, this is a great time to look at it with a small telescope because you get a really great view of the craters in shadow. You can also really see the turbulence from the atmosphere, and, and the moon is getting lower. Um, it just so happens at this time of year the first quarter moon is quite low in the sky. The first quarter moon is where the sun is going to be. Um, on the day of the fall equinox, the first quarter moon is uh, a quarter of the way around the sky from the sun. So it's where the sun is going to be on the winter solstice. So the first quarter moon is quite low um, in the fall. And so we're getting a lot of uh, turbulence in the air, a lot of twinkling, and that's why you see uh, the moon shifting around so much. With this telescope, uh, we get almost the, full, almost the entire moon in the field of view of the camera, which is nice. And then I can zoom in a little bit on some of the craters down here near the South Pole, um, and along what we call the Terminator, the line, the line between night and day on the moon. Really nice triple crater here with two of them connected right there, and then a mountain right there in the middle of that crater. Uh, just stunningly beautiful view. And we'll just sort of scroll up. Here's one of the Maria, uh, the Mare, right? So this is sort of a smoother region, uh, younger surface of Mars, the result of some big surface impacts about uh, 3.8 billion years ago, uh, smoothed out some of the craters uh, and some of the volcanic activity on Mars, and it's a darker basaltic material, so it really stands out. And of course, that's where people see the so-called uh, man in the moon, although I think it looks much more like a rabbit. 
uh, <laughs> and that's actually what they call it in a lot of cultures. Uh, scrolling up here and look at some of the other Maria. Some really nice, some really nice wide craters up here. Uh, sort of a fun astronomy hobby when you first get into astronomy, and you've got a small telescope, but you have a great view of the moon. It's to sort of learn some of the features of the moon and, and the geography and the geology of the surface of the moon. So how can you how can you learn more about the surface of the moon? Um, a good thing to do is to get a moon map, right? So actually, if I switch back over here to um, let's see, let me switch over to uh, show a moon map here. <laughs> uh, there we go. So uh, I don't know how many people know about this, but there's a moon map in Google Maps. If you go to moon.google.com or google.com slash moon, you get this sort of Google Maps style uh, interactive map of the moon. And it's fun to explore, especially because um, uh, there's some high resolution images from the Apollo missions that you can kind of zoom into and get a view similar to what the uh, planners for the Apollo mission were working with. Um, let me zoom back out a bit. Here is the Sea of Tranquility. That's this uh, area right here. Uh, and so actually you can see it pretty clearly in the image from tonight. Let's switch back to the telescope view here. Yeah, so if you look at this area right here, this is the Sea of Tranquility. And so the Apollo 11 landing site is right here uh, in kind of the uh, lower left. If you're looking, if you're in the northern hemisphere, um, those kind of the lower left part of the Sea of Tranquility is the Apollo 11 landing site. And so that's mapped in um, uh, <laughs> Google Maps and Google Moon. Okay, let's zoom in on that again. Okay. Yeah, so I think, is it right here? in this area, but I, I haven't actually tried to find exactly where it is recently. Uh, these, this is Apollo era reconnaissance images, and uh, you can see some of the artifacts from the way that they scanned the film and send the data back, sent the data back to the Earth. Um, wow. Anyway, I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting off topic here. Um, anyway, the, uh, the, moon, the Google Moon map is really nice. And now let me see if I can show you what I think is the rabbit, right? So here are two ears, and there's kind of the face of the bunny, and there's his front legs, and there's his back, and there's uh, his back legs. Um, some other people see a bunny uh, where these are the ears, right? So you have to kind of turn your head 90 degrees to the right to see this. These are the ears. This is his face. This is his body, and then he's got a tail. So there's the bunny tail right down there. Um, I think it's hard to see, uh, you know, to compare what you see in Google Maps or Google Moon with what you see in the telescope because, of course, the moon is round. So it's worth investing in a good moon map if you're interested in learning the surface features of the moon. And you can get these lots of places, bookstores. Uh, uh, this one is not a super detailed one but it does show you some of the major craters and it shows you which Maria or which, right? The Sea of Serenity, the Sea of Tranquility, uh, and so forth. Um, this is, of course, the near side of the moon. Uh, in Google Moon, one nice thing is you can see the far side of the moon, right? Part of the moon you'll never see in your telescope. Uh, and it's interesting why, you look at the far side of the moon, you don't really have nearly as many of the Maria as you do on the near side of the moon. You don't get the same bunny pattern on the far side of the moon, which is interesting. There's actually a reasonable uh, geological explanation having to do with the fact that the crust of the moon is thinner on the side towards the Earth because of the gravitational interaction with the Earth, the tidal interaction with the moon. There is this Maria down here. Uh, I think it's Orientalis is the name of it, um, which is on the far side of the moon, and it's the biggest, it's the biggest Mare over on that side. Anyway, I just enjoy looking with my eye um, at the moon through the telescope. Let's switch back to the live view here. There we go. And I'm just going to zoom in on a couple of other features here. I think these craters where you get sort of a mountain in the middle of the crater, um, that's not that uncommon with impact craters uh, where you have kind of a rebound in the crater and you end up with material building up there uh, in the center as well. Uh, one of the things I can do with this image, I've done in a couple of other live streams, is that there's a trick that astronomers do 
where you can take a movie of an object, a bright object like the moon or one of the planets, and uh, you can pull out the sharpest frames and then get a super sharp image of the object, like Saturn or the moon or whatever. So I think I'll do that here. I'll go ahead and uh, save a little video, even though that's a little bit, um, it, it's kind of suboptimal because it's so low in the sky. But we'll just grab, grab a little video here and maybe look at it later. The brighter areas of the moon are much older, and you can tell that because of all of the craters, right? You can see the the uh, much, much higher number of craters, for example, near the South Pole and the North Pole of the moon. And it just takes time for those craters to build up, so you can tell that the surface is old when there's a lot of craters there. Okay, well, let's talk about what's up in the sky, and... Uh, talk a little bit about some of the astronomy news from this week. So I'm going to switch over to my sky map. We have the telescope on the moon for now, but uh, in a little while we'll switch over to Jupiter and see what's going on with Jupiter tonight. So the star chart that I always recommend for people to get, the free star, uh, free star chart, which will show you uh, the stars that are up in the evening for that particular month, and it will also show you where the planets are relative to the stars for that, for that particular month, and it will also show you, um, a, it will give you a calendar of interesting events that are coming up, including phases of the moon. Uh, of course, you can't put the position of the moon on a monthly star chart like this, because in a month, the moon is going to go all the way around the sky to show all the phases. Uh, but yeah, you can show roughly the positions of the planets. This is the sky at sunset for uh, September. Now that we're getting into late uh, September, uh, you know, this is uh, sort of for earlier in the evening. So they're saying late September, 8 p.m. We've got Mars coming up over there in the east. I keep, I keep looking over there for Mars to see if it's actually going to come up uh, by 8 o'clock. <laughs> uh, I think it might be above the horizon, but kind of down in the clouds and the trees over there to the east. It's rising a little bit north of east uh, right now, um, and then it's going to be a little bit further um, this way. It's going to be a little bit further west on the sky as we get closer to opposition. Uh, the other thing the sky map will show you are things that you can see if you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, so star clusters and nebulae and things like that, um, some of which we looked at two weeks ago uh, when we were observing with the 12-inch telescope uh, back here. Uh, so let's see, what constellations and stars do I want to point out tonight? I think this time of year it's always worth looking for um, the Summer Triangle, right? So we've got Vega, Deneb, and Altair. So that's three bright stars that help you uh, find your way in the summer and fall sky. Uh, it's nice because usually in the winter and spring, especially the spring, I recommend using the Big Dipper uh, to find your way in the sky because the Big Dipper can help you find uh, lots of other stars and constellations. Uh, but the Big Dipper uh, in our, at our latitude uh, this time of year is quite low, kind of below the North Star over to the north. Um, and it's hard to see from our point of view here. It's down in the trees. So even though the Big Dipper never sets from the latitude of New Haven, uh, it's not very well placed. So the Summer Triangle is easy to find, three bright stars, um, I see them right now. I see Vega, Altair, Deneb. They're almost directly overhead from where I'm looking. Um, each star is the brightest star in its own constellation. And uh, it helps you orient to the Milky Way because the Milky Way sort of goes right through uh, the middle of the Summer Triangle. Um, it can help you orient to the Great Square of Pegasus, which is over here. It can help you orient to the Teapot of Sagittarius, which is down there. Uh, actually, just a little bit to the right of Jupiter, and so I think it actually might be in the tree from where I'm sitting, but if I were to move over there a little bit, I could probably see the stars in Sagittarius. Uh, I can also help you orient to Cassiopeia, so if you look to the north, and this time of year a little bit east of north, you can see the W of Cassiopeia, or the M. I, I think of it as just a zigzag of five bright stars, and Cassiopeia is always opposite the North Star from the Big Dipper. So if the Big Dipper is out, it's a little bit harder to see Cassiopeia. And if Cassiopeia is out, it's a little bit harder 
uh, to see the Big Dipper. So uh, there, you can usually see one or the other. Uh, it's pretty clear tonight, but not perfectly clear. And I am seeing some haze, and I'm seeing a few fluffy clouds over in that direction. But we are going to try to observe in my observing lab tonight. And I do think we'll have no trouble seeing uh, Jupiter and Saturn. I don't know, you can maybe see, I'm not sure if Jupiter is in the camera field of view anymore, but the moon is kind of a yellowish color. This is something else I noticed last week uh, when I was setting up for observing last week, uh, especially Monday and Tuesday, the sky was really uh, hazy and uh, the wrong color. <laughs> so during the day, the sky was this kind of grayish color. I think a lot of people notice this. Uh, and then at night, uh, everything looked kind of unusually yellowish or reddish yellowish. Um, and I'm fairly certain this was actually smoke from the fires out west. Uh, there was a, a, a jet stream dip that kind of brought the smoke up to Canada and then over New England. And so we were getting a lot of high altitude particulate matter from the, from the smoke. And it made the sky look really weird uh, last week, especially Monday and Tuesday. Uh, this afternoon, there was a beautiful blue sky. So uh, most of that smoke has cleared out. But the moon does look surprisingly yellow to me. Uh, but it is also getting quite low in the sky, which is something that happens when it's low in the sky. Let me try to point out some of these stars uh, with the camera. So uh, I'm going to try to point out the um, at least the Summer Triangle and the Square of Pegasus and Cassiopeia. I can also try to show these to you in the simulator. So before I get up, let me do that. So I'm going to launch my simulator here called Stellarium. There we go. So uh, this is what the sky looks like right now from New Haven. This is what it would look like really if we had no light pollution. <laughs> and we're not really uh, this lucky. Uh, but yeah, you can see the nearly first quarter moon low in the southwest over there. This matches with the sky really nicely. And then the bright, the bright thing that looks like a star over almost due south is Jupiter. Um, and then a little bit to the left of Saturn. I can see Saturn really clearly right now. Jupiter and Saturn are getting further away. But as Jupiter... Um, starts going uh, faster prograde, it starts going faster to the east, uh, it's going to catch up with Saturn. So they're going to get closer together in the sky in a couple of months. But uh, they're getting quite far away from us, right? We're, uh, you can, the sun just sat over in the west, and so uh, Jupiter is about 90 degrees to the sun right now. So as we go around the sun, Jupiter is going to be on the far side uh, of the solar system. Uh, yeah, let me keep checking on the uh, the chat. Uh, oh, hello, hello from New Haven to uh, Westport. Uh, yeah, if uh, the fire had an impact on viewing, yeah, it definitely did. I mean, uh, I, I everything just looked weird. I don't know people. I think who weren't even aware of the astronomy or the, the meteorology. The sky last week looked really strange, but it seems to have mostly uh, cleared out. Of course, the air air quality here was nothing compared to out west. You. Everyone's probably seen the stories on the news about the really terrible air quality um, in cities out west. So very concerning uh, about the wildfires. Anyway, back to our sky here. So we have Jupiter and Saturn down there in the south. Um, the moon and the naked eye planets are always in line with the ecliptic. So uh, if you see more than one planet or you see the moon and a planet, you can use those two objects to trace out the line of the ecliptic. Uh, so there you see where Mars should be over there uh, in the east, also close to the ecliptic. Um, now the constellations along the ecliptic are the zodiac constellations. So you're always going to see the sun and the moon and the naked eye planets in line with these constellations. So we have Jupiter in line with Sagittarius tonight. Saturn's kind of between Capricorn and Sagittarius. And there's Aquarius and Pisces. And there's uh, Mars right down there. Now there's another line in the sky that astronomers use, which is the equator, the celestial equator. The celestial equator is midway between the North Pole, right, which is on top of Polaris right there. Um, the simulator actually can show a grid of celestial latitude and longitude. So our celestial North Pole is right there next to Polaris. And then there's also a celestial South Pole, which we can never see uh, from our latitude. But if you go into the Southern Hemisphere, you'd be able to see the celestial South Pole. And if I hide the Earth, you can actually see there's the celestial South Pole down there. There's no south star like there is a north star in the northern hemisphere, so a little bit less convenient for finding south when you're in the southern hemisphere. Anyway, the celestial equator is midway between that celestial north pole and that celestial south pole, just like the Earth's equator on the surface of the Earth is midway between the Earth's geographic north pole and the Earth's geographic south pole. 
So this celestial equator uh, crosses the horizon due east and crosses the horizon due west. And then the angle it makes to your south horizon depends on your latitude. If you go to the North Pole, the equator goes down to the horizon. And if you go to the Earth's equator, the celestial equator goes up to overhead. Um, so you can use that for celestial navigation. That's a trick that astronomers use for navigation. Anyway, the point where the sun was today was exactly opposite this point. This is where the sun would be on the spring equinox, the March equinox, and actually where the sun is today. If I go back in time a little bit in the simulator, I can show you where the sun is. <laughs> There's the sun. Now, of course, when the sun's above the horizon, we can't see stars. But if I turn off the atmosphere, you can see where the sun should be. And you see the sun is both on the ecliptic. It's always on the ecliptic because the sun is always in the plane of the Earth's orbit. Uh, but today, uh, it also happens to be on the equator. And then tomorrow, it's going to be a little bit lower and a little bit lower and a little bit lower. And it's going lower and lower in the sky, which makes it get colder here, right? So this is what's causing the seasonal chilliness that we have in our fall and winters. The sun's going to lower and lower angle in the sky until, of course, uh, when we get to the spring, uh, when the sun is going to be at that point 180 degrees around right over here, which is where it is on the spring equinox. Now, Mars is nearly at that point, right? Mars is getting kind of close to that point. If we kind of see how is Mars moving, relative to the stars. You see Mars is kind of heading for that point. And so uh, in, a, in about two weeks or so, Mars will be opposite the sun. The Earth will be between Mars and the sun. We call that opposition. And that's going to be a good time to look at Mars with a telescope. Even right now, it's actually good to look at Mars with a telescope. It's still pretty close and bright. So if you stay up till about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, even midnight uh, tonight, then uh, you should see Mars, very bright red star, sort of um, in the um, southeast or south-southeast sky, bright red object, and it's going to be brightest around October 13th. Okay, let me go back to uh, right now and continue to talk about the stars. Um, these constellations of the zodiac, none of them are really very bright this time of year, right? Sagittarius is maybe the brightest and the most obvious with the teapot uh, pattern that you can see. But uh, it's pretty low, and I think it's behind the tree right now. But we'll look for it in a second. Um, I think going up to the Summer Triangle is a good bet. So there's the Summer Triangle, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And then going left over to the Square of Pegasus, like so, is a good bet. Can I see? Uh, I can see some right now. I can see some of the stars uh, in the Square of Pegasus. I have some of the observing deck lights on so that you can see me. Uh, which is affecting my night vision a little bit. I can see some of those stars in the square of Pegasus, but maybe not uh, all of them. Um, and then there's lots of interesting things to look at in the direction of Pegasus. In a couple of weeks, when it's a little bit higher, uh, we'll look at some things in Pegasus, like uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, and then over in this direction towards Cassiopeia, the double star cluster, some of my favorite mid-fall and late-fall objects to look at through a telescope. Uh, if we look around to, let's see, the north, um, we're losing Arcturus, you know, this bright red uh, spring star. You might still be able to see it kind of in the west-northwest right at sunset, but we're basically losing it. Um, and if you're looking for the North Star, because you're looking for north, yeah, it's going to be hard to see the Big Dipper this time of, time of year. Um, you can kind of use Cassiopeia. I find that kind of the top, if you kind of take the top of the, the zigzag in Cassiopeia and kind of follow that to the, to the left and kind of away from the east, um, away from the eastern horizon, you go a little bit higher than the North Star, but then if you kind of artificially drop down a little bit, you can find the North Star, which is, which is quite a bright star. We're getting uh, most of the constellations in the myth of Perseus and Andromeda coming up over here. So we've got uh, Cepheus the king, right, and Cassiopeia the queen, uh, Perseus the hero, right, who slayed Medusa. There's Medusa's head right there. And the variable star Algol is the eye of Medusa. Andromeda the princess, and you can see the Andromeda galaxy right there. Uh, close, uh, uh, big spiral galaxy that you can see with the naked eye if the, uh, if the sky is dark. Um, and then uh, the flying horse, of course. Pegasus the flying horse is right over here. And then the sea monster is down here. So this is that whole, uh, you know, the Clash of the Titans story, right, where Perseus... Uh, 
saves Andromeda from the sea monster. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, are all of these in the Milky Way? Yes, everything that we're looking at in the sky is in the Milky Way. There are four objects, uh, well, no, three objects. There are three objects outside the Milky Way that you can see with your naked eye. Um, you can see the Andromeda galaxy if the sky is really dark and you know where to look. So that's another galaxy outside the Milky Way. And then in the Southern Hemisphere, there's the small and large Magellanic clouds, which are satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. So, you know, if you were to take away from the scene here everything in the Milky Way, um, all of the stars would go dark. The Milky Way itself would go dark. You can see kind of the plane of the Milky Way right over here. It goes right through Cassiopeia, and it goes right through the Summer Triangle, like so. And the center of the Milky Way is over here in the direction of Sagittarius. So all of that would go black, and you might, you'd see the Andromeda Galaxy, and you'd see the Magellanic Clouds if you can see it from your latitude, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's there. Um, are the rest not in galaxies? All of these stars are in the Milky Way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me see what we can see with the camera. So I'm going to switch over to the live view and the camera. And uh, I'm tempted to turn off the deck lights. Maybe I will actually turn off the deck lights a little bit, or at least the white lights. Yeah, so we've got some red light now. This is uh, the way we set up the observing deck for public night or for um, you know a class, the lab that's going to come up because when uh, when it's a little bit uh, darker, the red lights don't affect your um, night vision as much. So it's handy if you're doing amateur astronomy to have a um, to have a, a red flashlight or put a little red cellophane on your flashlight to make it a little bit easier to see. Okay, let me focus on uh, the moon here so that I'm sure that you'll be able to see the stars. So uh, adjust the focus again here. The moon is right down there in the... Um, I can move the camera over maybe a little bit. <laughs> you can see the... Uh, you can see the back of the telescope. Yeah, the moon's a little bit too low for me to get in focus here. I'll focus instead on... Uh, on Jupiter up here. Actually, I think I'm our, I think I might already be in good focus. Okay focus anyway. Okay. Um, so there you see Jupiter and Saturn right over there. And so um, Jupiter is on the right and then Saturn's on the left. And then the constellation of Sagittarius, the uh, teapot, would be right in here, right behind that big tree. Um, see if there are any other bright stars. There's the bright star Fomalot which uh, you can see coming up in the southeast. It's really only the only bright star in that part of the sky. And I don't see it either with my eye nor uh, in the camera. Let me see if I can see it uh, in the stream. I don't actually see it. Oh, let me actually, I can do a little bit better on the focus. So let me adjust that a little bit better. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit better. Yeah, so I don't see foam a lot. I just see the planets over there. Let's see, let's scroll over here. Do we see Mars? No, I don't see Mars. Mars should be... Mars is actually, from my point of view, probably right there below, behind the dome. Um, let's see if we can see the... Uh, Summer Triangle. So we're going to go up. Oh, there's Altair right there. So there you can see Altair. And that's the brightest star in Aquila right there. Um, and then if we sort of turn around and go up a little bit more, we can see Deneb and Vega right there. So there's Deneb, and you can see some of the stars in the, uh, the Swan. So there's Deneb right there. And then over to the right, that really bright star is Vega. Uh, let's uh, let's see if we can see Pegasus now. So I'm going to swing over to above the dome. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can kind of see it. See if I can point out. So I can clearly see this star down here, which is in Pegasus, and the other three stars in the square of Pegasus are not really obvious to me. 
Um, yeah, there's one just above the tree, the treetops there, which is uh, actually the one where um, the one where it comes off from uh, uh, from the, the square to, to be part of the constellation of Andromeda. A little bit hard to see. Let's see if we can see Cassiopeia. I'm going to be over here in the northeast. There you can see the astronomy building. My eyes are starting to adapt to the red light, so I can see a few more stars. So there is Polaris right over there. And so I just need to move over this way a little bit and then up. Yeah, so you can see that zigzag. Uh, you can see the zigzag there kind of in the middle. And then um, those stars, I can see some of the stars in Cepheus as well. <laughs> nice. And I've got uh, the star Polaris there a little bit over to the left. So, yeah, nice view of these stars. This camera lens is quite nice for looking at uh, uh, faint scenes. So it works pretty well for that. Okay, well, that's what's up in the sky. Um, so before I move the telescope, you know, i got the telescope over here. Um, and we could uh, move over to Jupiter and Saturn and maybe the double star Albireo uh, and take a look through the telescope. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the astronomy news. And there's really only kind of one big piece of astronomy news that everyone's interested in. So uh, probably uh, most of you heard about this, the uh, discovery of this gas in the clouds of Venus. So let me just talk about that for a second, and I'll, I'll show a couple of... Uh, slides about it. I'll leave the red lights on for now. So uh, feel free to ask questions if you've heard about the story and you have any uh, questions about it. So um, this was a, an announcement that I heard about on Tuesday afternoon, right after my uh, Planets and Stars lecture class. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's really, really interesting. Uh, and, you know, for astronomers who are looking for exoplanets that are similar to the Earth or looking for signs of life as we know it elsewhere in the universe, one of the things that we think is feasible is to look, look for these biomarkers, you know, look for signs of, um, uh, look for uh, compounds or uh, evidence uh, that uh, is only caused by life and not caused by other chemical, geological uh, processes. Um, and this paper came out in Nature uh, this last week uh, about this detection of this gas PH3. So that's one uh, phosphorus uh, atom and three hydrogen uh, atoms. And it's very poisonous, right? So how could you associate that with life? Well, the thing is, is that it's hard to make. Phosphine is a molecule that uh, is hard to make. And so the only places we see it are uh, in places where there's anaerobic bacteria, um, like, um, well, the famous example that I've heard about in a lot of the discussion is in sewage waste, water treatment plants, in swamps where there's decaying matter. So places where uh, there's not oxygen, but there's life that's uh, existing on, um, that's undergoing metabolism and reproducing and so forth, sometimes it produce phosphine gas. There's quite a bit of it actually uh, on the earth because of this process, because of the biological process. There's also some phosphine that we've discovered um, on Jupiter and Saturn, in the atmosphere of Jupiter and Saturn. And this clearly has a non-biological origin. It's coming from the deep, hot, high pressure uh, parts of the planet. Uh, and then we can see it in the atmosphere. And there's a clear chemical explanation for it. But for, um, and we know that Venus is hot, right? So Venus is super hot. So isn't it similar to Jupiter and Saturn that way? Well, no, I mean, Venus is hot, but not that hot and not that high pressure. Venus is a terrestrial planet like the Earth with the same uh, mass and same size. Um, and, you know, people have speculated about life on Venus in the past. Um, I saw this article by Carl Sagan uh, from 1967 speculating on uh, life on the surface of Venus, even after we knew that it was very hot. Uh, maybe there could be, um, maybe there could, maybe it's cold enough near the poles or tempered enough near the poles to support life as we know it. Um, well, um, because phosphine is one of these biomarkers that it's much easier to discover, it's much easier to produce if it's produced by life, 
the fact that you see it in Venus is really, really interesting. It doesn't prove that there's life on Venus. Um, and I was looking around for some balanced articles about this. You know, the headlines that you see in some websites are uh, the, the Venusians are coming for us and they smell bad. <laughs> they smell like sewage. Um, or, uh, you know, or, or even, you know, the, the, the more reputable news organizations, possible life on Venus. You know, that's the catchy headline. You know, probably not. There's probably not life on Venus. Uh, there's probably some uh, interesting geological chemistry going on that we don't understand. Um, but it is among the best evidence for a biomarker that we know about so far. Um, there's also methane on Mars, and there's some interesting compounds that, we're, that we see in the ice geysers of Enceladus. Um, for the methane on Mars, uh, one interesting thing is that it changes with the seasons. Right, which is something you'd expect from microbes or something like that. If the temperature changes, the methane might change. Um, but there's not very much of it. It's a very low amount of methane. And you can explain it using non-biology, non-life. But this gas in Venus, um, it's hard to explain it without life, uh, given what we know. Um, so uh, it's, 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 a big, it's a big unknown. It's a very exciting big unknown. Um, and one of the most exciting things, I think, to see in planetary system astronomy, in radio astronomy, in uh, search for life as we know it, in finding biomarkers around other planets, one of the most exciting things to happen in many years, in, in uh, maybe 10, 20 years, I think. Anyway, I was looking for good, well-balanced well articles. Uh, and Phil Plate, I think, has a good article on his Bad Astronomy blog. So astronomers may have found evidence of life on Venus, uh, but maybe not <laughs> uh, in the clouds, not on the surface. So that's actually important. Um, the temperature and the pressure in the clouds of Venus are much more temperate and much more uh, amenable to life as we know it. Um, there's actually an altitude on Venus where a human being could potentially survive given the temperature and the pressure, uh, unlike most places in the solar system, as long as you have an oxygen mask and as long as you have protection from the sulfuric acid cloud. So you need, a, you, need a, a, you need a suit to protect you from acid and you need a source of oxygen because of course Venus's atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Uh, but still, I thought this was super cool. Uh, very, very exciting news. I'll, link, I'll put a link to the Phil Plate article and I, or I recommend that you search it out if you're interested in a rigorous and accurate ex explanation of what was found without too much hyperbole uh, or hype. And I think one of the most exciting things about this is that it means that uh, any plans to send uh, orbiters or uh, balloons or um, uh, drones, uh, hovercraft, gliders, you know, that could glide around or float around in the atmosphere of Venus and study the chemistry, uh, all of those plans have been accelerated, brought to the top of the priority list for JPL and NASA. So uh, I'm really excited about that, and I can't wait to learn more about it. I think it's probably not life, uh, but uh, I think that we're going to learn a lot of interesting stuff uh, about uh, Venus by studying this, this phenomenon. Okay, let's, uh, let's go look at Jupiter and Saturn, um, and then maybe we'll have to stop for tonight. So... I'm going to uh, switch back over. Let me see if I have any questions. Yeah, I avoid <laughs> avoid phosphine on Earth and double avoid it on Venus. Yeah, it's, you know, phosphine isn't isn't even the worst thing about Venus. <laughs> if you wanted to go visit, you know, there's the the temperature, which is like 600 Celsius at the surface. Uh, there's the pressure, which is like 100 atmospheres at the surface, so you'd be crushed. Um, and then there's the sulfuric acid also, so you'd be dissolved. The clouds on Venus are basically droplets of sulfuric acid and a little bit of water vapor and some other things, but basically sulfuric acid. So not really a place you want to hang out. Uh, uh, but now there's interesting stuff to study. There's, <laughs> uh, you know, this really interesting discovery of a potential biomarker. Okay, let me switch over to the telescope live view again. I think we should still be on the moon unless it's gone beneath the trees. So here we go. Yeah, no, so it looks like the moon's gone beneath the trees. So let's see if we can get Jupiter in the field of view of the telescope. 
Now, as I said a minute ago, this is not a computer-controlled telescope, so what I'm going to have to do is grab the telescope and move it and try to point it at Jupiter. So you're going to see me uh, manipulating the telescope here. And I don't have an eyepiece on it. You know, If we were doing public night, we would have an eyepiece here so that people can uh, look through the eyepiece at Jupiter. And we have step stools, of course, so people of different heights can get up to the eyepiece and see it. Uh, yeah, the moon is well into the trees, but Jupiter is still way up there. So what I'm going to do is grab the telescope and push it. And I'm going to change the tracking mode from um, tracking at the rate of the moon to tracking at the rate of the stars. So there's a button here I need to press to do that. And then I've got two, uh, I've got two things that will help me find Jupiter. Let me turn the lights back on so you can see them. So I have here a so-called Telred finder, which is like a reflex sight. It just puts a red circle in the sky to help me point the telescope. And then I have a little mini telescope right here, which is a low-power telescope. It's about, uh, I think, 6x magnification. And when I have the, the bright object centered here, it should also be centered in the main telescope point of view. And then here's a little video camera, which is connected to my laptop over there. All right, let's see if we can find Jupiter and see where the moons are tonight. Um, I was looking at it with my 5-inch telescope, and so had a good view of the moons. Okay. I see some of the uh, stars in Sagittarius also are just a little bit below it. All right. All right, looks like we've got it. Might need to focus a little bit. I'll leave the camera on the telescope so you can see what's going on up there. And we can center it a little bit better, maybe. And let's see, can we see any details? Um, I think I need to, might do, need to adjust the focus a little bit. Let's see what the moons look like. So let's uh, raise the exposure a little bit. Boy, it's low and shimmery. This is the thing. Okay, I definitely see the moons. Let's raise this up a little bit. Yeah, so there are the moons. Over a little bit. Yeah, and there are all four... Galilean moon. So let's see which ones are which. I'm going to look them up in uh, in Stellarium here. So I can see which ones are which. Here, I'll show you what I'm looking at in Stellarium so you can see see the simulator view. Okay. So we've got uh, Jupiter right there. I don't see the red spot. Oh, the red spot's coming right around on the edge there. So if we get a sharp view, we might see it. Um, so we've got Callisto, Io, Ganymede, Europa. Those are the, the four Galilean moons. So if we switch back to the live view. Okay. <laughs> so Ganymede, Io, Europa, Callisto was the order, right? Uh, Ganymede, Io, Europa, Callisto. So there they are. And they move every night. I mean, they move over a few hours. You can actually see them moving around. I'm going to try to adjust the focus just a bit to see if... Uh, Get a little bit sharper. Now, again, I don't have a motorized focus. So I have to step over here and turn the focus knob. Now, that'll make the telescope shake. So, uh, you know, it's just it's not a great night for sharp views just because of the turbulence and because Jupiter is so low, so that may be as good as it gets there. A little bit better. 
That might be as good as it gets. Um, yeah, for the same reason that the moon is uh, low in the sky this season, it just so happens the Jupiter hemisphere. They're getting a great view of it in the southern hemisphere. And it takes 12 years for Jupiter to orbit once around. So in six years, we'll have a better view in the northern hemisphere uh, of Jupiter. I'm going to uh, bring the exposure time back down so that uh, you can try and see if there are any features on the surface. The thing is, is that the, the moons are much, much, much brighter. Um, well, no, sorry. The, the planet Jupiter is much, much, much brighter than the moons. And so you can't really see them uh, in the same exposure with a camera. Of course, you can see them in the same exposure with your eye. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty blurry as it. I can barely see the cloud bands. So very blurry sky tonight. Uh, not the best night for getting sharp images. Uh, oh, let's see, there's a question. Uh, uh, is there an estimate as to when the planetarium will be open to doing these in person again? You know, I think we'll be able to open to uh, for observing, which is outside, right? I'm outside on the observing deck right now. And um, I do have permission to um, have some students, you know, small numbers of students come to the observatory for in-person labs. I think no more than 10 people at a time can be in one place wearing masks and standing apart and so forth. Um, but, uh, you know, I, because, of the, because the university is trying to minimize contact between, certainly between students, but especially between students and um, <laughs> faculty and staff uh, and members of the community, um, I think it's going to be uh, a while, certainly it's going to be a long time before anyone's allowed in the building. And as for doing observing outside, well, I'm working on it. <laughs> Uh, I'm lobbying for it, but uh, I don't know exactly how long it's going to take. Uh, maybe before the end of the year. Kind of depends on how, you know, the case rate continues and uh, how situation at Yale College and Yale University continues. Um, but uh, stand by. I would be surprised if we're open to the public before the uh, uh, before the end of the year. Um, and you know, the planetarium is really not a place you want to be. So I'm resigned to having the planetarium theater closed until this is all done, you know, until uh, <laughs> until it's not a hazard to be inside a building with 50 people uh, breathing their air. <laughs> so um, just have to wait, just have to wait until it's safe again, do everything online. Uh, but yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep, uh, I'll keep talking about the um, potential of doing outside outdoor observing uh, out here on Tuesday nights. Um, because I think that's uh, you know that that could happen. I think that could be done safely. We've got alcohol wipes to wipe down the telescopes, and we've got masks, and we've got hand sanitizer, and we can stand far away from each other and look at the sky. Anyway, before we shut off for tonight, why don't we take a look at Saturn, which is just a little bit to the left of Jupiter there in the sky. I can clearly see it. Now I predict it's going to be muddy like Jupiter is, but let's uh, let's try it. All right, so you can see it in the camera right about there. So I'm just going to look through the finder scope and nudge the telescope to the east a little bit and then to the north a little bit. Okay, so right about there is where it is in the sky. Yeah, and there it is. Um, there it is in the camera. Let's zoom in on it and get it centered a little bit. See the rings? Those look pretty muddy. But let's uh, have a slightly longer exposure. And it's jiggling around all over the place. <laughs> wow, that's one of the worst views of Saturn I've seen in a while. <laughs> it's really, really... Uh, it's like doing a uh, kind of a dance. <laughs> uh, the rings are almost like a hula hoop, uh, kind of doing a doing a wiggle around the planet. All right. Well, uh, let's stop there. Um, I will actually. I said I was going to demo my five-inch telescope, so let me just do that for a couple of minutes, and then uh, I'll sign off for observing. So we'll switch back to the main camera here.
So yeah, I think this telescope is a really good telescope for someone who really wants a telescope for astronomy mainly. Wants to spend about two hundred dollars. That's about the cost of it, um, and you get a really nice uh, package. You know, I'm, I don't get any uh, kickback or money or anything for when people buy these. It goes to Astronomers Without Borders. But uh, it's an organization I admire and respect what they're doing, and I think it is actually a really good telescope. You get, you definitely get your money's worth when you buy the telescope, and it's also upgradable, which is nice. So if you decide you're interested in astrophotography, you can put the telescope on an equatorial mount and have it track the sky. Um, it comes with this sort of tabletop mount like this, so you can tilt it kind of up and down. And actually, I'm gonna look. I'm just gonna look at Saturn through the telescope. It's got a finder here that just puts a dot on the sky. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, in your eye with the eyepiece, it looks a little bit sharper because you, kind of, you can kind of filter out the wiggles with your eye, but it's still pretty blurry tonight. Um, but, of course, with a telescope, the main, the main, the most important part there is the mirror, right? So you can see there's a five-inch mirror at the back of the telescope, and it's a Newtonian design, so the light goes back to that mirror and then bounces off the mirror and starts converging to a focus, goes back up. There's a secondary mirror, which is, let's see if I can get it, there we go, right there. And that sends the light out 90 degrees to the eyepiece right here. And you focus the eyepiece by turning it in its holder that moves it in and out, so it's a helical screw focus. And there's an eyepiece holder right here, and you can change the eyepiece. Now, it comes with two eyepieces. Um, but uh, you, if you have one of these, you probably want to upgrade the eyepieces. This is one of the first upgrades. Um, and so you change the magnification that you get by changing the eyepiece. So with this eyepiece, I was getting about 30x magnification. And with this eyepiece, I would get about 100x magnification. Uh, and you just refocus for the new telescope, or the new, sorry, refocus for the new eyepiece, and you uh, have a nice view. Um, it's, uh, I say that it's more for astronomy than the refractor because um, you see it, it is sort of designed to point up at the sky. It's kind of meant to be comfortable for looking up at the sky when you've got it on the tabletop mount like this. Uh, the other thing is that the image is upside down. So uh, you, if you're looking at the moon, uh, the image is inverted, and so you get used to that. But, you know, if you were trying to look at birds in the trees or whatever, the mountains or whatever, it'd be annoying to see everything upside down. So a refractor with an inverting prism is better uh, for doing that kind of thing if you are sure that you want to have a telescope for, for nature viewing in addition to astronomy. Um, one other thing that people don't like as much about Newtonians is that you do have to align them. So this mirror in the back, you do have to make sure that it's aligned with the secondary mirror and the eyepiece. And I don't think it's hard to do. You know, you have to, you kind of have to learn how to do it. It's it's a process called collimation. Um, so you, you know, you look with a special eyepiece at the mirror. There's a dot on the mirror, and you adjust these screws to get to tilt the mirror to get it aligned. You know, um, there are videos on YouTube to show you how to do that. Um, you know, when we get back together, I'd be happy to show anyone how to do that. But uh, once you learn how to do it, you can do it in a minute or two, and then you're ready to go for observing. Um, I like how uh, compact this telescope is. The secondary mirror housing here, you can actually slide it into the main body of the telescope. So it really does telescope. Right? Uh, and then there's a cover that goes on the front to keep it safe. And then you can just pick it up from the handle here, you know, throw it in your car. Can't quite throw it in your backpack, but, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty portable. And then, as I was saying, it's upgradable because it has a standard... Um, dovetail mount here. You can take it off of the tabletop mount, like so. And, uh, you know, you can put this on an equatorial mount. So you can actually get a good tracking equatorial mount for $250, $300. Um, and so you've spent $500 to get a good Newtonian telescope and a good tracking equatorial mount, which you could use for astrophotography. Um, and you're, you're started in the hobby. So um, then you just get maybe a webcam or even a small SLR cam or mirrorless camera to put at the eyepiece to take pictures of whatever you're interested in. 
Yeah, so I recommended this telescope to a lot of people. I can put a link uh, in the uh, description for the video. There are other telescopes like it. Um, Orion makes a telescope called the Star Blast. I think the Star Blast 4.5, and it's a similar size, but it doesn't have the same collapsibility or the same portability, and it's not, um, you know, in support of astronomy outreach and education. So. Um, I like this telescope a lot, and I do recommend it. But I also don't hesitate to recommend that 90-millimeter refractor that I've shown a couple of times to people. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to have to sign off here and get to work. Let's see if there are any last questions from people. I uh, have hard cider and filters for observing, or what, fritters. Oh, hard cider and, and fritters. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Let's see if I can get uh, <laughs> Yale University to buy us a <laughs> cider. I've got my cup of coffee, which uh, you know, keeps me warm on a chilly uh, evening like this. Uh, but sounds good to me. All right. Well, thanks to everyone who tuned in for the live stream. Um, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to email me. Uh, so my email address is michael.fason, F-A-I-S-O-N, at yale.edu, and I'm uh, happy to answer your questions as, as quickly as I can. Um, if you're interested in seeing something, me talk about something, or hearing about something, or seeing something in the sky on the live stream, I'm happy to take requests and talk about particular things. Um, uh, and trying to do these live streams on Tuesday nights, rain or shine, uh, and if it's clear, I'll set up some telescopes for viewing of planets and constellations and sometimes with the big telescope, uh, dark, uh, fainter things like nebulae and star clusters and things like that. All right, well, uh, with that, I wish everyone well. Uh, thanks again, and see you next time.